it was about time a physician was driving her daughter to preschool and she noticed that she had left her stethoscope on the seat. The daughter reached over and got hold of it and put the little stethoscope earpieces in and her mother was sitting there going, oh, this is beautiful. She wants to be a physician like me. She's going to follow in my footsteps. Suddenly the little girl went, welcome to McDonald's. <laughs> May I take your order, please? You know, children do the most adorable things. Um, I love the story of the young ball player and the older gentleman. And the older gentleman loved to walk out beside the, the park and go out by the fence every day hoping that kids would be playing. And so this particular day, he walks over to the fence, this little boy's in center field, and he says to him, uh, what's the score, son? And he said, 17 to nothing. And he said, um, who's winning? The little boy said, they are. He said, that, you're in a pretty bad predicament. And he said, no, I'm not. We ain't been to bat yet. <laughs> that is hope. That is hope. And our text for the day that Angela read is a text full of hope. The Apostle Paul says, you know, sometimes I struggle. I would rather sometimes be, I think I would rather be in this life, uh, but then I'd rather be in the life to come. Sometimes I wish I was there, but then I look back at this life and I have to decide. Dick Crowder was pastor of the First United Methodist Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, when he received that terrible late night call in 1979. It was a police officer who had responded to a car accident Dick's son Richard had been seriously hurt and his best friend Bruce had been killed in this head-on. And it changed in an instant. Crowder said it changed our lives in an instant because for weeks he was in rehab, for years he continued in rehab, and then <clears throat> he has lived at their home for the, up until now. And Dick wrote an inspirational book called Keep, Keep On Keeping On. As he reflects on the story of this baseball player and the old man, this story of hope, he writes, there's something about the human spirit that will not let us give up. No matter how low we get, or how bad things are, or how many strikes we have against us, we seldom, if ever, throw in the towel. We are given the patience to endure the worst things imaginable. Ask the families of the 280 killed in this week's earthquake near Mexico City. I'm sure that number has risen today. Ask the students in Illinois whose Mattoon High School teacher thwarted the efforts of a young man who was out to kill people in the school cafeteria this week. Ask the people of Puerto Rico whose homes and livelihoods have been devastated by Hurricane Maria. Ask the survivors of Hurricane Harvey and Irma Ask the people of South Korea who have become numb by the saber rattling of Kim Jong-un and President Trump as they smear each other on the public stage. By God's amazing grace, we are given the patience and the strength to endure some of the worst imaginable events in life. I know that some of you have had to endure the death of a child or of a spouse. I have even seen you fight cancer and win. I have seen you lose a job and keep your hope and keep your focus on searching for another job. I have seen you step out of an abusive relationship and allow God to bathe you with God's amazing, cleansing, healing grace. What is the common characteristic that I see in you? I see hope. Why? Why is it that we have hope? What helps us to gain a fresh perspective when the world around us believes that we should just curse God and die? It's because we are a people of hope. When I was serving as a pastor in Charlotte, North Carolina, one of my church members who was 83 years old was Zeb Black. And now at that time, when I was like 26, 83 seemed like an awfully far distant spot. But now that I'm 62, I'm like, man... 83 is really young. 
So, so Zeb, Zeb was this chew, chew, tobacco-chewing 83-year-old who was just amazing, and he had a lot of wisdom. And I said, Zeb, what is it that helps you in life to remain hopeful? And he said, it's the fact that this is God's world. God's got charge, and I'm just passing through. I'm just passing through. This is God's world, and we are here for such a brief moment. You don't want this kind of sermon to be depressing. We are here just for a brief period of time. And the question is, what do we do in that period of time when we are just passing through? We know, according to what we believe, that there will be a day when we will be in heaven, where we will be in that place where um, all those who believe in God, I think whatever their faith tradition might be, will be present there. And the Apostle Paul rejoices so much in this promise of eternal life in our passage that Angela read that he couldn't decide whether he'd rather go on to heaven or remain on this earth. Philippians 1.23 says, I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. And then he encourages And he decides that he would rather remain in order to encourage others in their growth for Christ. Paul knows that we are just passing through. When I was back in Virginia, there was a woman named Becky Bruce. She was 47 years old and she was battling cancer. And it was very, very near the end. Her family was gathered around her. And about two hours before Becky's death, she opened her eyes, looked at her family... And she said, I know how to get to heaven. You've got to love everything. Love everyone. And two hours later, she breathed her last. That was her final word. Becky was just passing through, but she won the battle because she was heaven bound. It would seem that the natural inclination for believers then would be to get on to where we are going. I certainly look forward to being in heaven one day and singing in the choir with my mom, who was a marvelous alto, and hear daddy singing the bass line, Amazing Grace. Oh, he never sang up in the octave we were supposed to be in. He had this wonderful low melody. Now, I, I know... I know that we look forward to that, but Christians, Christians, as one friend of mine said, are amphibious creatures. Like a frog, we are able to live on the land and in the water. And so the Apostle Paul says, I would would love to go on to heaven, but I'm going to stay here to be an encouragement to you. And he says, the Christians who live this kind of life filled with hope have three characteristics. First, We are of one spirit. Paul encourages us to stand firm in one spirit. Whatever we are, whatever we encounter, we must stand firm in the power of the Holy Spirit. When someone speaks rudely to his wife, stand firm. Let him know that his actions are dishonoring her and the marriage covenant. The folk song says, We are one in the spirit. We are one in the Lord. That unity of spirit will enable believers to find the truth, to discover that which is pleasing to the Lord. So we are one in the spirit. We are of one mind. Paul says that we must strive side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel. Kenneth Callahan says, Do you perceive that for your congregation the best days are ahead or the best days are behind you? Is, are the best days ahead for 32-year-old Grace Covenant or are the best days of this church's life the prior 32 years? It's a tension. It's a very healthy question for pastors and ruling elders and deacons and Sunday school teachers and women's groups and Bible study groups to ask, are we going somewhere in Grace Covenant or have we just been somewhere? God says the best is yet to come. The devil says The best has already happened. Striving side by side with one mind means that we will work together to accomplish the goals God has set for us. The new youth wing is evidence of that. 
Tonight, youth and young adults building nine square in the air is evidence of that. The mission study being released this week to us is evidence of that. As you look for your next pastor, you begin that journey. Coming on Tuesday evening at 6 o'clock to meet Jeff and Christy Boyd, who are our missionaries in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, is evidence of that. Come at 6 o'clock, meet Jeff and Christy as they're coming through to visit with us and then head on to Louisville, Kentucky. Continuing to seek ways to be more faithful to Christ is evidence of this one mind. We are just passing through. If you don't believe me, ask those who sweated and struggled to build this sanctuary 29 years ago. Some of you are still here, but a number of those persons who built this sanctuary are not here because they have died and they have gone on to be with the Lord. And they are believing that the best is yet to come for Grace Covenant because God has been so faithful in the past that God will continue to be faithful in the future. And third, Paul says, you are of one spirit, one mind, and we struggle together. God has graciously granted us the privilege of not only believing in Christ, but suffering for Him. Some of you struggle when your family doesn't understand your commitment to Christ. Some of you struggle at work when the language and the actions of others are so counter to God's will that you speak up and people look at you as if you're from a different planet. In a very real way you are. You're not a frog particularly, but you can live in both worlds. We are of one spirit, one mind, and we struggle alongside each other. No one faces life's calamities alone. Ask Hurricane Harvey survivors who have benefited from the $37 million raised by Houston Oilers' J.J. Watt. Ask Monica Puig, the Olympic gold medalist from Puerto Rico, who has set up a fundraising effort through youcaring.org. Ask the families of the 19 children and six adults who were killed in the school collapse in Mexico City during the earthquake. Ask the 11 children who were pulled from that rubble by rescuers who did not sleep until they were all accounted for. Ask Janet Ensign as our deacon, Kendra Holtzman, was with her last, last week as her mother, Jean, breathed her last. We are of one spirit, one mind, and we struggle together. Let me close with this final word from Dick Crowder, the one whose son was, was seriously injured in the car accident. Dick quotes a poem that strikes home for us. Let us learn from the bird for a moment to take sweet rest on a branch that is ready to break. She feels the branch tremble, yet gaily she sings, what is it to her? She has wings. She has wings. So think about the bird. If the branch breaks, God has created her with wings. She can fly away from danger. But we aren't birds. Human beings don't have wings. So how do we begin to handle suffering and struggle and hardship? Crowder, who has faced so much in his life, says, One of my strongest beliefs is that God has put within the makeup of human beings something that enables us to rise above and overcome burdensome problems to make the best of any situation, and to not be fearful even if we are perched on a limb that is ready to break. God has instilled in us a faith to believe even in uncertain times, to trust even when life is caving in around us. And he concludes, I truly believe, I truly believe that in the makeup of every person, there are wings. I believe it. Because we are just passing through. Let us pray. Lord, help us as we pass through this life to make a mark for you. Amen.